Today I want to start a new series. If you'll take your Bibles, go to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. List the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to be looking at these nine fruits that uh, the Holy Spirit will produce in us if we will let Him. There are two commands we have in the Bible. We need to, to be filled with the Spirit and walk in the Spirit. And I believe if you'll do that, you will produce these ninefold fruit of the Spirit. Uh, we could call this grace fruits because it's all about the graces of the Lord God manifested in our lives. In verses 19 through 21 in Galatians 5, Paul listed the works of the flesh. He said the works of the flesh are manifest. And he names adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envy. Long list, isn't it? This is all the work of the flesh. And he says, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In contrast now, in verses 22 and 23, we have the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And against such there is no law. Now there's laws against that other list, isn't there? We pass laws against the works of the flesh. But there's no laws against the fruit of the Spirit. And these are really three basic categories. Uh, Godward, love, joy, peace. Outward, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness. Inward, faith, meekness, and temperance. We're going to be looking at these nine things in the Sundays to come. And if you, if you look at this, isn't that a picture of Jesus Christ? Jesus manifested every one of these. And if we will abide in Christ and walk in the Spirit, these things will happen and be true in our lives. So the first one we're going to look at is love. The agape love of God. Now, we, we hear a lot about love today, don't we? I told Russell, I said, there's a lot of love songs we can sing, uh, a lot of it, of the world. And, I, you know, the world really doesn't understand this agape love. This, this is not of the world. This is of God. People today, they think of love as just an inexpressible emotion. But, folks, love is not just feeling and emotion. It's not something that uh, comes upon you. It's a choice. What the Bible says is this is something we choose to do. We choose to love and express love one to another. It's not uh, an uncontrollable passion. This idea of falling in love. You know, just, it's an accident. You accidentally fall into love. Then you fall out of it, you fall in and fall out. And that's what the world thinks about. And yet the Bible says, hey men, the Bible says, husbands, love your wives. Not something you fall into, it's something you choose to do. I choose to love my wife. For better or worse. Unconditional. Here, here's the thing about agape love, it's unconditional love. It's not based upon whether she pleases me or not. Is that the way God loves us? It has to be. <laughs> if it's based on conditions, we'd be in trouble. But God looks down upon a sinful world, and He chose to love us unconditionally. That, cho that choice involves conduct. I think one reason there's so much confusion about love in our world today, you know, in the Greek, there's three words for love. In English, we got love. I love Betty. 
I love Chinese food. I love snow. No, seriously, I don't. But We use one word to describe a lot of different things. Now, in the Greek, which is more expressive than English, there's at least three words for love. Eros, we get the word erotic. Eros is a romantic love, which is good. There's nothing wrong with that. It's kind of love a husband and wife have for one another. It's kind of love that's, that's kind of reserved for the marriage relationship. Like the young couple, John said to Susie, Susie, will you marry me? Susie said, no. John said, why? Is there someone else? She said, there's got to be. Maybe you've been there. Then there's phileo. There's another Greek word for love, and, and that's an idea of friendship love. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. So phileo speaks of a brotherly love, a friendship kind of love. And, and that's good. But the love we're talking about is the word agape. It is the love that God has shed upon our hearts. It's the kind of love that God has for us and the kind of love that God can produce in us. You know, sometimes when they, when they want to show a diamond, they'll put it on a, a black background. That contrast to make that diamond shine even brighter. I think that's what Paul is doing. He takes the fruit of the Spirit, these nine diamonds, and he puts them on the black background of fleshly works to show the contrast. And so there is, the first diamond is love. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we're going to look at this passage to help us understand the kind of love that God wants us to have, the kind of love that He will produce in us if we will walk in the Spirit. Now, we're going to do a little fruit inspection, all right? When we go through these nine, we're going to be examining ourselves to see whether or not we are cultivating these grace fruits in our lives. This agape love, Paul says, excels everything else. He says, verse 1, If I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, which is love, I'm sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. If I to get to prophecy and understand mysteries and all knowledge and have not love. If I'm very uh, beneficent in giving to others, none of this thing really compares to love. Love supersedes all of these. The greatest of these is love. Now, beginning with verse 4, he gives us a description of the kind of love that God wants to produce in us. First of all, it is a steadfast love. Here's the description of love. There's ten of them, but we're going to go through them pretty quickly. First, it is steadfast love because he says in verse 4, this love suffers long. Are you long-suffering? Are you patient? Do you give up on people? Do you fall out of love because of something that's been done or said? Did Jesus have this kind of steadfast love? John 13, 1. It says, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Loved unto the end. Steadfast love. Hey, this is a forgiving love. This is a 70 times 7 type forgiveness. Secondly, it is serving love. It envies, or it is kind, excuse me. It is kind, this love. Kind to one another, serving one another. So well now, preacher, what about those people that don't deserve my kindness and love? It's not based on that, is it? We don't look at it, what people deserve. 
It's what people need. Give them what they need. Let me give you another verse. Luke 6, 27, 28. It says, Love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. That's not easy, is it? We're going to need help. We're going to need God to work in us and give us this kind of love that can do that. It's hard to keep mistreating those who are constantly being good to you. Thirdly, it's sincere love. It envies not. See, if you're a jealous, envious person, are you showing love? Are you showing love towards others if you envy them? Hey, if I envy what you've got, I'm not rejoicing that you've got it, am I? We need to be able to rejoice with others when God blesses them. True love is sincere and rejoices when another is blessed. It's not envious. The Bible says, Proverbs 14, 30, A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. So if I'm going to be a mature, spirit-filled Christian, then I need to have this sincere love for others. Number four, it's self-effacing love. It vaulteth not itself. It's not puffed up. See, true love is going to be humble. This is the love of God. It's going to be humble, not self-righteous, not proud. How can you love somebody when you're looking down on them? Can pride and love dwell in the same heart? Proverbs 13, 10, By pride cometh contention. I think a lot of church problems we have today, and a lot of home problems, a lot of family problems. Really, it's ego against ego. It's self-love and self-righteousness butting heads. Number five, it's self-restraining love. It does not behave itself unseemly. See, this agape love is going to be courteous. Never going to be rude toward others. Those who profess to be Christians and are always rude in dealing with others. If you go to the restaurant and you're rude to those waiting on you, that's not a good testimony. It's not a good testimony of a Christian. We ought to be courteous at all times. Hey, parents, I think we need to get back to teaching our children to say please. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Teach them just courteousness in how they speak to others. Courtesy, somebody said, is love in little things. Number six, it is self-denying love. It seeketh not her own. It's not me first. It's not, again... These people are always demanding their rights. Be careful about that. How, how can a Christian be that way? How can we demand our rights when we've been crucified with Christ? How does a dead man demand his rights? Not God's purpose for us to always seek our own. We're to give to others. We're to live for others. Somebody said if you teach people their rights, you'll have a revolution. But if you teach them their responsibilities, you'll have revival. Do we have the mind of Christ? The Bible says in Philippians 2, 4, look not 
every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. And he said, this is the mind of Christ. This is how the Lord lived when he was here. The way he wants us to live. Number seven, it is serene love, not easily provoked. You know, some people just have a hair trigger temper, don't they? Doesn't take much to set some people off. They're easy to anger. You know, we talk about losing their temper. They don't really lose it, do they? It keeps coming back. We wish they would lose it and it would stay lost. But some people are just always on the verge of exploding. It just doesn't take much to set them off. Why are people like that? It's because they don't have this agape love of God because this is serene and not easily provoked. I heard about a woman who joined a certain church. She was telling her friend why she decided to join this church. She says, not because of the preaching or the singing or anything like that. The reason I joined that church is that Sunday morning I heard a woman sharply criticizing the pastor to his face in front of other people. And I watched to see how he would react to that. And when I saw how kind he was to this lady, who so unfairly was criticizing him. I knew in my heart, that's the man I want for my pastor. So Matt, we've got to be careful, don't we? People are watching us. Amen. I don't have a problem with this. We have some here that are easily provoked. Number eight is sacrificial love. It rejoices, or it thinketh no evil. I keep getting ahead of myself. It thinketh no evil. It doesn't carry a grudge. It's not vengeful. It is able to forgive and forget. You know what it costs to do that? It costs us something to be forgiving. We're going to have to pay a price to do this to forget those who offend us. The church I pastored in Arkansas, never forget, to, we had a young man in that church and his family was pretty prominent in that little country church. Been there for a long time. But that family had a reputation in that community. It was not good for the church. I'll never forget that young man was telling me he said, Preacher, if you ever get on our bad side, we'll never forget it. He was proud of that. He should have been ashamed of it. He was proud that his family had this reputation that if you ever crossed them, they'd get you. That's not the way Jesus was. When reviled, he reviled not again. Number nine, it's sympathetic love. It rejoices not in iniquity. What does that mean? Rejoicing in iniquity. When you see somebody fall into sin, do you laugh and run tell others? Do you think it's funny? Do we rejoice in such times as that? The gossiper rejoices in iniquity. We ought to weep when our brother stumbles. We ought to be sad when that happens. Now, that's not saying that we condone sin or overlook sin. Sin has to be dealt with. And in church, it's got to be dealt with in the membership. But we do not rejoice in doing this. It's something we do with a heavy heart when discipline is necessary. But true love is sympathetic. How would you want to be treated if you were the one that fell? 
If you're the one that stumbled, how would you want others to treat you? 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. When you see a brother stumble or sister, you ought to remember there by the grace of God go I. We could all stumble. and We need to always reach out and minister one to another. And number 10, it's suffering love. It beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love means that we can weep with one another in our grief. On days like this, we, we wonder, why does God allow suffering? Why did the righteous suffer? Couldn't God make it to where there would be no suffering? Well, sure, all it had to do was not create any people. If God had never created any people, there'd be no suffering. Or if he could create people who are robots programmed to do a certain thing. But God can't have fellowship with a robot. No more than you can have fellowship with your washing machine. When we choose to obey God, when we choose to love God, when we choose to walk with God, then God is blessed and God has fellowship. And so because of this, because of sin in this world, they're suffering. I want you to think about something else. You know, God, you might say, took a divine risk in making man. Because he knew when he made Adam and Eve that somewhere down the road, this is going to cost me. Do you think that God knew what Adam and Eve were going to do when he made them? Did he know they were going to sin? Sure he did. He's all knowing. He knew that they would transgress and that from them would come a sinful humanity that would constantly grieve God. And yet God chose to make man anyway. And in choosing to make man and love man, God chose to suffer. I thank God he did. I'm glad to be here, aren't you? And God suffer? Well, the Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is grieved, is he not in some sense suffering? We can vex the Lord. And that's something that involves love. Sometimes my car vexes me. It vexed me this week. It wouldn't start. And I was vexed for several days. But my car cannot grieve me. My children can grieve me. Only somebody you love can grieve you. And so we pay a price when we choose to love because we choose to suffer when we do. The second thought this morning is the development of love. First of all, I want you to see that it's supernatural. This agape love, the fruit of the Spirit, is supernatural because only God can produce this. This is not something I produce in myself. It's something God produces in me through the Spirit. It's powerful. It's powerful. Some of you may have heard of Elizabeth Barrett Browning, the poet, poetess. Elizabeth Barrett was an invalid. She could not walk. She was bedfast. Couldn't even lift her head from the pillow. One day, Robert Browning paid her a visit. She fell in love with him immediately. And on his first visit, she was able to lift her head. On his second visit, she was able to sit up. 
On his third visit, she eloped with him. That's the power of love. Agape love is something we bear. Like a fruit tree bears fruit, we bear this fruit. God produces it. Let me give you a couple of verses here. Romans 5, 5 says, The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. You see this? This is the love of God, and it's shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. It's what He does. Also think about John 15, 5. Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abides in me, the same brings forth much fruit. See where it comes from? If I'm abiding in the vine, Jesus Christ, and the Spirit of Christ dwells in me and fills me, and I'm walking in the Spirit, then I can produce this fruit. I can be fruitful. And I'll love. I'll be a loving person. I heard about a guy who was teaching his young son about angels. And he wanted to teach this boy that there were uh, two kinds of angels mentioned in the Bible. There was the seraph and the cherub. Seraphim, that's plural. Cherubim is plural. He was teaching that cherub means knowledge. Seraph means flame or passion. He said, son, the cherubim excel in knowledge, while the seraphim excel in love. Cherubim usually the messenger angels. The seraphim are the worshiping angels. The little boy's listening to that. He said, well, daddy, I'd want to be a seraph because I would rather love God than just know about him. That's pretty good. It's supernatural love. And secondly, it's in the Savior. We must abide in the vine, the Lord Jesus Christ. We think about fruit trees. I was reading that in in Florida, there are certain trees called sour orange trees. The fruit's not really good to eat. It's kind of an ornamental type thing. If you took a bite out of one, you'd have immediate Lockjaw, very sour, beautiful, but so sour. But you can graft into one of these trees a sweet Valencia bud, and as the bud gets going, you can cut the top off, and new life comes out, and the new life produces sweet oranges. That's how you get a sour orange tree to bear sweet oranges. Only way you can. Now, that's what's got to happen for us. See, here's what happens. People, they try to do this in themselves. They prune it. They transplant it. They spray it with chemicals. They rename it. They, you can take a, that tree and, and tie sweet oranges on it. And then you can get some string and just tie on it. And not producing that's what people will do they will try to become a Christian by self-reformation they transplant themselves from one church to another pretty regularly they rename themselves they try to tie this fruit on themselves But it's all a waste of time. Folks, this is something only the Spirit of God can do. It happens when you are born again. And you have a new nature given to you. The nature of God is given at salvation. And then you're able to produce this fruit. This agape love cannot be produced. By the place, not by self-discipline, not by instruction, not by self-reformation, not by transplanting, only by abiding 
in the vine. The Lord Jesus Christ. What's fruit for? It's to be eaten, isn't it? Hey, you know what the world needs today? It needs to see the fruit of the Spirit in the lives of saved people. We need to demonstrate this. You know, all fruit produces seeds, I guess, as far as I know. And the seeds that come from the fruit, in our case, would be new converts. As we live for Christ and walk in the Spirit and demonstrate this in the world, it's going to draw other people to Christ. They're going to be saved. And that's how we reproduce. That's how a Christian reproduces. Amen? Hey, do you, do you desire to be fruitful in your Christian life? Well, first of all, have you been born again? This can never happen until you've been born again and brought into the family of God and given as a partaker of the nature of God. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh.